Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone who is joining our webinar, New Therapies for Erectile Dysfunction. My name is Anna Maria Giraldi. I'm the president of the International Society for Sexual Medicine. And I want to welcome you all on this very special day where I think we all woke up to a severe international situation that I'm sure we are all worried about. So despite that, um, I hope you will enjoy our webinar and I hope you're all safe. The webinars of the ISSM are planned by the Education Committee and I want to thank you, the Education Committee and especially uh, Patricia Pasquale who are in charge of our webinars. Can I have the next slide, please? For those of you who might not have joined our webinars before or knowing of the ISSM, I just want to tell you that the vision of the International Society for Sexual Medicine is that every human has a being has the right to a healthy and satisfying sexual life. Next slide. Our society was started in 1982 with a focus on impotence at that time it was called. And now we have changed the society substantially and it's, um, to, it's uh, focusing on the whole field of human sexuality. So our mission is to be the most respected and trusted source of information, education and professional development on human sexual health through the delivery of world-class publication, research findings, online and in-person opportunities for knowledge exchange worldwide and our webinars is a part of this, both the mission and our vision. Next slide. The ISSM is an umbrella having regional societies in both North America, South America, Europe, the Middle East, the Asian Pacific region and the South Asian um, region. And we also are affiliated with ISWIS, the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health. So we have a very, very broad range and include members from all over the world with different specialties. Next slide. If you're not a member or if you forgot it, um, you might uh, consider becoming a member, renew your membership. And one of the benefits being a member of the ISSM is that we have our four excellent journals. We have our video journal, and prosthetic surgery, and then we have the Journal of Sexual Medicine, Sexual Medicine Open Access, and Sexual Medi Re Medicine Reviews, and you will have access to all these journals if you are a member of our society, and that's only one of the benefits you will have as a member. The next slide. So having said this, it's a pleasure to welcome the faculty. Uh, we have three distinguished experts on erectile dysfunction, and it's a pleasure to introduce our moderator for this webinar. It is Dr. Nuno Tomada from Portugal. Dr. Tomada is a specialist in urology, in sexual medicine and men's sexual health, and he is located both in Lisbon and in Porto. He's a very busy man. He's at the Center for Genital Aesthetics and Reconstructive Surgery in Porto in Portugal. He's the vice president of the Portuguese Society of Andrology, Sexual Medicine and Reproduction. He's also a member of the executive committee of the European Society for Sexual Medicine. He's involved in the EAU section of genital urinary reconstructive surgery, and he's a very active clinician and um, also a researcher. So thank you for taking time in your busy schedule, Nuno, and being here. So I'll hand it over to you. Welcome. Thank you, Anna Maria. Pleasure is all mine. Thank you for the kind introduction. And uh, so welcome everybody to this uh, uh, webinar on new therapies for uh, erectile dysfunction. We will have a wonderful program and uh, we'll discuss very controversial issues. Um, the PRP, the stem cells, the Botox, and also the low intensity shockwave therapy. Uh, we will start with the two presentations and we will have the discussion in the end. Uh, it will take about uh, 30 minutes. Uh, please uh, leave all your questions and I hope there will be many uh, in the Q&A Q button and I'll go through all the questions and put to our panelists. Um, so let's start with the, the first presentation. Um, 
about PRP, stem cells and Botox, novel ED therapies on 2000, uh, 2022, snake oil, or true therapy by uh, excellent uh, uh, friend and known, well known by all of us, Trinity Balvivalacqua. He's um, a professor of urology and oncology at the Parliament Center for Advanced Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, and uh, I, I don't think he only more uh, introduction for from my part because he's uh, almost a legend in our field. Uh, so um, uh, Trinity, I'll leave the floor with you and uh, thank you once again for being here. Thank you, Nuna. That's very kind of you, actually. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and uh, I'd like to also thank Anna Marie and the ISSM um, webinar uh, series uh, members to, for inviting me to give this talk. Um, I'm going to do a brief overview. Uh, I will highlight some of the major uh, clinical trials uh, that have looked at uh, PRP, stem cells, or as well as stromal vascular fraction and some new trials that have been done with Botox. I will not discuss the preclinical evidence for each of these. I will briefly discuss Botox because this is sort of the new, um, the new player on, in the field. Uh, and therefore I'd like to just sort of give some insight as to the potential mechanisms by which this may work. Um, so I'll start uh, now. These are my uh, disclosures. Uh, I will not be discussing um, any, uh, there's no conflict with any of uh, the trials that, that I conducted in the past or as well as conducted now. Um, so really nothing to disclose. So first, I think it would be important to talk about uh, the term restorative therapies. So restorative therapy is a term that, that really encompasses uh, the field of regenerative medicine. Um, regenerative medicine is thought to, or the goal is, is to replace or regenerate human cells, tissues, or organs to reestablish um, or restore normal organ function. I'd like to make the point here that it's that this field is less than 15 years old. This term was sort of coined in the year 2008. Now, granted, we we had been doing other uh, uh, gene-based, gene therapy, cell-based therapies prior, but this is sort of a new field that has really boomed, especially uh, in the 2000s and 2010s. Um, in, in urology, as well as in sexual medicine, um, the, the term restorative therapy has really taken on um, uh, its own sort of, um, its own field because it utilizes, it's where we're utilizing tools uh, that were uh, coined in regenerative medicine uh, to reestablish organ dysfunction. So as relates to penile uh, organ dysfunction or otherwise known as erectile dysfunction, we're gonna use different tools, cell-based therapies, um, uh, stem cells, biologics uh, to reestablish penile vascular function. So that's the concept. The, uh, currently as, as everybody that's on this webinar knows that ED is um, a symptom that we treat with uh, medications. First, uh, PDE5 inhibitors, we then, then we move to uh, intracavernal injection therapy to inject uh, pharmacological agents to restore or bring in blood flow. And if this is ineffective, uh, then we proceed to some type of surgical intervention and in the placement of an inflatable penile prosthesis. I think that as it relates to restorative therapies, we would be utilizing some form of uh, regenerative medicine uh, technologies to um, really treat those patients that um, uh, that have severe ED. And some would argue that we should be even moving this early, um, higher up in this algorithm, which we'll discuss briefly uh, or discuss further in this, uh, this, in this presentation. So in restorative therapies and sexual medicine, what is it? Platelet-rich plasma, stromal vascular fraction, stem cells, amniotic fluid, have all been used uh, for erectile dysfunction, peyronie disease, and, and some have even um, uh, suggested that it could be used for penile enhancement. Uh, I'll, I'll make the point that low intensity shockwave therapy is acknowledged as a restorative therapy. We're gonna hear a wonderful talk from Dr. Masterson and next about how uh, this may um, uh, hone stem cells uh, to restore uh, angiogenesis uh, and neuronal function. So I'll leave that for him to go through. But my focus today is going to be talking about platelet-rich plasma as well as stem cells and stromal vascular fraction. So 
what is the clinical evidence for, for these two forms of restorative therapy to manage male erectile dysfunction? So I will make the point here that we're talking all about men and not, fe and not uh, female sexual dysfunction, but happy to discuss that in the question and answers question if, if, if people have questions. So what, um, when we look at the major players in stem cell therapy and neurology, it started off by us potentially thinking that we could use embryonic stem cells. However, there's major ethical issues with using embryonic stem cells and the abilities for these to uh, proliferate and, and transform into malignant potential. We're using induced pluripotent stem cells. Um, I think the everyone acknowledges that mesenchymal stem cells, which you can isolate from bone marrow, from uh, the adipose tissue, is really where the field initially started. Skeletal myoblasts have also been used. Uh, especially as it relates to management of urinary incontinence in women. There's actually a really nice trial that looked at that, but it really hasn't taken off as it relates to male erectile dysfunction. We can also isolate stem cells from the urothelium, actually from urine uh, or from the kidney. Um, and these are, have inherent um, uh, possibilities. But really, the field of sexual dysfunction has looked at the role of mesenchymal stem cells. Now, mesenchymal stem cells have are easy to isolate, culture, and manipulate, okay? They're easy to isolate because we can take them from the bone marrow. Um, we can take them from adipose tissue. Um, and, and, and they can easily be genetically modified ex vivo, so they could secrete various um, uh, uh, genes uh, that could improve blood flow, help with neurogenesis and the like. And the mechanism of action by which mesenchymal stem cells cause anti-inflammatory uh, effects uh, is by actually secreting growth factors, cytokines, chemokines, which actually um, are the true mechanism by which stem cells actually um, uh, cause improvement in erectile function. It's actually not the stem cells proliferating and becoming new smooth muscle cells, endothelial cells and nerves. It's actually the paracrine effects by releasing these cytokines growth factors that cause the mechanism of action. The problem is, and I'm not going to go into this in this presentation, but once again, happy to discuss it in, in, the, um, in the question and answer, is that you actually have to do a bone marrow biopsy or you have to do a liposuction uh, uh, or isolate fat to get these stem cells. So it's, it's a little bit harder uh, to get a pure population of mesenchymal stem cells. But there actually was a, a really nice trial that was done um, out of, um, sorry, my slides are not advancing here. Apologize. Uh, there were no, there's a nice uh, uh, trial that was done using actually something called stromal vascular fraction, which is actually isolated from adipose tissue. And it has a, a, a number of different cellular fractions that are believed to actually cause wound healing, um, as well as um, uh, improvement in uh, blood flow and, and neuronal function. The stromal vascular fraction is made up of a number of cell types, adipose derived stem cells, uh, endothelial progenitor cells, uh, as well as hematopoietic cells. So these are all um, uh, different cell types that are secreting growth factors and cytokines with actually promote tissue repair, angiogenesis, and actually can even in enhance stem cell recruitment. So the field is transformed into potentially using stromal vascular fraction. Now, in order to do that, um, you actually have to have a isolation machine in order to do it. Now, this is just an example for a nice review by Nora Haney and, and Wayne Hellstrom, um, published in uh, Sexual Medicine Reviews a couple of years ago, where they talked about the actual process and, and by which this happens. I can tell you from doing a trial using um, a isolator like this from tissue genesis, it's actually, it's, it's very straightforward to do, but it is time consuming and you have to have a plastic surgeon who's doing the, um, who's doing the liposuction and then you isolate the stromal vascular fraction and then it is injected into the penis intracavernosally. And currently, at least in the United States, there's no FDA approved device in order to do this. So it's really not used in clinical practice. So one trial that was done, once again, out of France, used the stromal vascular fraction or, or they termed the bone marrow mononucleated cells, it's essentially the same um, uh, group of uh, cell types. And they used it in a post-prostatectomy, erectile dysfunction uh, in men that were post-prostatectomy. I, I bring this up because I think it's just a nice trial that shows really simply one thing and that it was safe. It was clearly a very safe approach 
Um, injecting into the penis uh, absolutely uh, had no uh, deleterious effects on, on the patient. There was obviously bruising of the penis um, and there was swelling, but, but no uh, systemic effects. In this trial, they found that there was an improvement in erectile function post prostatectomy in patients that uh, were given um, uh, bone uh, marrow mononuclear cells, which is essentially stromal vascular fraction. But I want to make the point, and this is sort of when you look at these trials, you have to point, we have to read between the lines here, the devil's in the details, and that they reported that, that there was an improvement only with pharmacotherapy. And by the way, the pharmacotherapy that was used in this trial was intracriminal subjection therapy. So um, I don't think that that, that that would prove efficacy, but truly uh, shows that it's safe. Now, because of the issues related to isolation of stromal vascular fractions or mesenchymal stem cells, the field is really moved into potentially using PRP. So PRP is platelet-rich plasma. Um, this is isolated uh, from a peripheral um, uh, blood draw, a venous draw. This is autologous, so using the a, a patient's own um, autologous blood. Uh, the thought is, is that when the platelets are activated, so you have to actually activate the platelets, um, uh, ex vivo, uh, they once again secrete cytokines and growth factors, which improve angiogenesis and potentially help with uh, anti-inflammatory and, um, and wound healing. Now, this has been used, unfortunately, throughout the United States, as well as the world, uh, uh, to treat ED without really any much mechanism or excuse me, much evidence to support it. Why is that happening? Because it falls under the HCTP 361 exemption by the FDA, which essentially says you can use a biologic that is taken from the patient, so autologous, um, and, and is, as long as um, it is autologous and taken from the patient. So you don't have to actually establish safety and efficacy, and it, and it, and it, is, uh, it is exempt from FDA approval. So unfortunately, it's being used throughout, and it's actually being used for, um, uh, for treatment of ED, as well as some of the other indications with, with uh, for uh, pay for service. So essentially you have to pay a significant amount of money. Some patients are paying over $2,000 for a, a PRP injection. You oftentimes will hear it called the Priapus uh, shot. Now, what is the evidence to support this? Well, unfortunately there is no evidence. There's one ED randomized controlled trial to date, and we'll review it. Um, it's not covered by insurance in the United States or Medicare, therefore it's um, cash only. Um, and there's no CPT billing code for PRP. So a lot of practitioners are actually getting cash and then they're billing the patient for a CPT code uh, for a uh, non-specific blood transfusion and reinjection, which is honestly just um, uh, really, I believe, very unethical. But let's look at the evidence because I think this may have um, some legs. Uh, Ryan Terlecki out of Wake Forest did the first study to look at safety and efficacy of uh, PRP. He actually used it. Um, he used a platelet-rich fibrin matrix, activated it, injected it into patients with a wide variety of sexual dysfunction, ED, Peyronie's disease, even had someone with stress urinary incontinence. Bottom line is he showed it was safe, but there was no efficacy data here. The only trial that has looked at efficacy is a nice study that was published last year in JSM which looked at patients with mild ED. So these are patients that had mild erectile dysfunction. And what they found was, is that they saw an improvement in the IIEF um, uh, erectile domain scores of approximately three to four um, uh, points at one month, three months, and six months. And these are essentially patients that actually would respond to PD-5 inhibitors. So these are patients that, that really, um, I would argue, um, uh, would, uh, potentially could be a major placebo effect here. This trial, we have to acknowledge, it's a wonderful trial. It's double blind, randomized, placebo controlled. However, there was a very little information in the methods as to um, how it was blinded, how the patients um, knew uh, how they, what they received intracavernosally uh, as it related to the placebo. So I think, um, I think the jury's still out. We really need multi-institutional um, studies in patients that really are PD-5 inhibitor non-responders and have more severe ED before we establish this. So take home message for stem cells and PRP and SV and SVF, it's safe, efficacy unknown. I don't think that stem cells and FBS are gonna make it into clinical practice. I actually believe that biologically have the most potential, but it may be, it's, it's, it's hard to do because of isolation problems. 
And PRP really has no role in clinical practice because of the lack of evidence to support this. Um, unfortunately, PRP, as you can see in this slide, is, is, is abused. It's being used greatly in North America as well as around the world. Um, so uh, it is unfortunately out there uh, without any data. And I think it's our job to be able to report um, really the true efficacy of this. And the SMSNA um, last year came out with a, um, uh, our um, a position statement on this uh, as to restorative therapies for ED. I would highly recommend that you take a look at this. It's an open access, the sexual medicine open access journal so everyone could see it. And I'll make the point here is, is that the ISSM is also putting together a position statement with, which is essentially gonna be a more data-driven as to the role of restorative therapies in ED. I'll spend the last couple of minutes talking about Botox because I think, as I said earlier, this is the new player in the field. So what is the role of bloat Botox or clinical evidence for Botox in for management of male erectile dysfunction? So it is thought that it acts via inhibiting acetylcholine release at the presynaptic cholinergic junction. This is from data from the bladder, obviously. Um, but in the, in the penis, as well as any vascular organ, it's thought to reduce penile vascular resistance. So you would enhance penile blood flow. And it's thought to potentially have a regenerative, nerve regenerative um, effect in, in, in those that have peripheral nerve injury. I'll show one slide from uh, preclinical evidence for the use of Botox. This was data that was published by Jeff Campbell, who's in um, Ontario and Canada uh, at the SMSNA meeting last year. He showed in a, in a nerve injury model, in a rat a bilateral cavernous nerve injury model, that you were able to actually increase intracarbonosal pressure to nerve, it, to nerve stimulation in, in those rats that, that received Botox. And I'll make the point here is, is that if you have nerves that in, are intact, he showed an increase in neuronal nitric oxide synthase, so potentially um, affecting uh, neuronal uh, synapsis and uh, neuroplasticity. If you had injury, he did not see an effect in the, in the rat peens, and he saw that it actually enhanced alpha smooth muscle actin. So these are, the, are, are some theoretical benefits of Botox, once again, preclinically. So what is the evidence for its use in, in the patients? Two trials, randomized controlled trials from the same group, Egypt, last year, and actually uh, about a month or two, about a month ago. So what is the, uh, what, what do these trials show? These trials were, once again, very well done as it related to randomization. Um, the uh, first trial uh, looked at uh, pa patients with vasculogenic ED, um, if you look at the top here, you can see that uh, patients came in with severe um, uh, erectile dysfunction. And at two weeks, three weeks, six months, we saw a significant improvement, at least as it related statistically, in IAF score. And we saw that the patients that received the 100 new, uh, international units had a better improvement. Once again, the improvement, however, though, was marginal, 4.6 points. Interestingly though, the, the placebo patients saw no effect. As we know in all ED trials, um, you always see a placebo effect in, in patients. It's a great um, uh, psychologic effect. We see here, um, uh, we break it down to diabetes and those with uh, uh, vasculogenic ED. Once again, the benefit, very marginal, only see an improvement in IIF score or the SHIM uh, score of only a couple of points. So. My, my thought here is that my interpretation of these two trials is, is that, is this truly clinically significant? I think what we probably could potentially use Botox in is patients where we want to give them a potential improvement where they can become a PDE5 inhibitor responder. So I think my summary of Botox is early on, only two RCTs, don't really have a lot of clinical evidence to support it, but the, this data can be validated. Uh, and need to be studied in multi-center. Um, we need to look at the potential long-term durable effects. And as I said earlier, these could, this could be used to salvage PDE5 inhibitor non-responders. That is my last slide. Um, I wanna thank the ISSM and uh, I'm happy to take questions later. Thank you very much. So thank you again, Trinity. It was a, a, a wonderful talk, very interesting. 
and uh, uh, I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions, but for now, I'm not seeing anyone in the Q and A button. So please put your doubts there so I can uh, allocate them to either Trinity or the next speaker. So we'll go uh, with the next presentation, shockwave therapy for ED, uh, review of devices, um, uh, devices, uh, and uh, sorry for uh, recommendations uh, by Thomas Matheson. Sorry for not understanding my own writing. So I'm going to introduce you. Uh, Thomas is um, a young urologist, but he's already assistant professor of urology at the University of Miami and is a fellowship of uh, trained in male fertility and sexual uh, medicine and uh, uh, has a, a very active role in investigating uh, shockwave therapy. So I'm really eager to uh, hear from him uh, the new data that uh, he probably will show us. So Thomas, the floor is yours. Thank you. All right, thank you for that introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you to the ISSM for allowing me to present today. Uh, I certainly don't have as much of a track record as Trinity. Uh, but hopefully I will do some justice to this topic. Uh, all right, so I have no relevant uh, disclosures. So treatments of erectile dysfunction, uh, we re reviewed in the last talk a bit, date back to the 1970s with the introduction of the penile prosthesis. Since that time, we now have oral and injectable medications, most of which focus on the nitric oxide pathway to restore erections. Now, the symptom of erectile dysfunction may be relieved with these medications. However, the underlying pathology is not. And this has introduced an interest into restorative therapies for erectile dysfunction. Excellent. Uh, the restorative and regenerative therapies include shockwave therapy, platelet-rich plasma, and stem cell. The focus of this talk will be specifically on shockwave therapy. Now, as urologists, we are most familiar with shockwave in the context of kidney stones. With kidney stones, we're talking about shockwaves that are focused to a very small point and are of very high energy. And that's what actually allows the sound waves to break apart the stone. When we're talking about erectile dysfunction, we're talking about shockwaves delivered over a larger focal area and at a much lower intensity. And this is not causing the same sort of damage that again would crack stone, but possibly be transmitting energy within to the penis itself. So just to quickly review, what are the basics of shockwaves and what constitutes a shockwave? A shockwave is a disturbance that propagates through any medium. And in this case, we're talking about the penis. These shockwaves actually tra travel faster than the speed of sound, and can deliver energy into the tissue. So looking down here on the graph, what you're seeing is a very high amplitude, high peak pressure wave with a very quick drop off over a very short amount of time. And I want to differentiate between a shock wave and what is called a radial wave. Next slide. So radial waves are what are, if you're here in the United States, uh, are advertised under the, the, the title of Gaines wave. And what radial waves are, are not the same as shock waves. They're closer to just a sound wave. So looking at the graph here, what you'll see is that the shock wave having a very high peak amplitude and quick drop off, whereas this, the radial wave is actually much less pressure over a longer period of time. So the maximum pressures in radial waves are actually about 100 times lower than that of a shock wave. And the duration of the pulse is actually almost 1,000 times longer. So these uh, radio waves actually are not able to deliver energy into the tissues uh, the same way that shock waves do. Next slide. So there are three main types of shock wave devices that are marketed, and these include electrohydraulic, electromagnetic, and piezoelectric. And again, all of these are capable of, of creating a shock wave. Again, radial pressure waves are different. When these devices are being evaluated by the FDA, 
they get classified based on what their risks to the patient are. Radio waves are a class one device, which means that they effectively have almost no risk to patients, whereas shock waves fall under FDA class two, which does require FDA oversight and approval for use. That means that these devices do need to go through clinical trials uh, to gain approval. Now, when looking at the three types of shockwave devices, there have not been any direct comparisons. So I did uh, a search on clinicaltrials.gov to see what some of the devices uh, being investigated uh, for shockwave therapy for erectile dysfunction, and this includes a list, a list of them. Something to note is that none of these devices are specifically indicated for the treatment of erectile dysfunction. These devices were approved under what's known as a 510K approval. What that means is these devices need to be sufficiently similar to a device already on the market. So if you actually look to see what some of these devices are approved for, you'll see that they generate shockwaves, and in these cases for plantar fasciitis or for the treatment of diabetic foot ulcers. Now, this is with the U.S. FDA. Some of these devices have been approved for erectile dysfunction uh, in other countries. However, in the United States, to date, there is not a single shockwave device approved for the treatment of erectile dysfunction. So how is the energy from a shockwave delivered to the penis? There are three main mechanisms, mechanotransduction, microcavitation, and then the thermodynamic effects. So as the sound waves travel through the penis, we believe that this is what's happening inside. Next slide. So where do we have mechanistic data? It comes almost, well, it comes exclusively from animals. Uh, Tom Liu's group uh, looked at shockwave therapy in uh, diet, or sorry, in erectile dysfunction rat models, looking at diabetes, hypertensive, and obesity models. From their studies, we saw that shockwave therapy increased intracorporeal pressures after treatment. It activates penile stem cells, increased arterial endothelium, and even increased factors involved in angiogenesis, including VEGF, ENOS, and CD31. Next. So in this somewhat summary slide of what may be happening inside the penis, the shock waves through those three mechanisms is likely activating resident stem cells, activating nerve repair, restoring normal endothelial signaling, recruiting uh, the immune system for wound healing, and even recruiting in new stem cells to replace damaged tissues. So how about human mechanistic studies? We actually don't have any. The reason for this is that many of the studies that were performed in animals just can't be done in humans due to technical considerations and just ethics about uh, taking biopsies or, or um, investigating penile tissues. So despite this, and I apologize for how small this slide is, uh, there is growing clinical data. So I did a search uh, last week to see how many trials uh, on clinicaltrials.gov are investigating shockwave therapy for erectile dysfunction. 16 studies have already completed, and there's currently eight that are active and enrolling. I want you to look in the column of interventions. Now, what makes sometimes interpretation of the data difficult is the heterogeneity in devices that are being used and the heterogeneity in control groups, some compared to placebo, some compared to active treatment with PDE5s. Next slide. So at our institution in 2017, we performed a meta-analysis looking at randomized control trials comparing shockwave to placebo. Listed are the seven studies that were included, and we, this included 602 patients with an average age of 60 years with five months follow-up. And compared to placebo, the shockwave treatment had an increase in IIEF scores of 6.4 compared to 1.6 in sham. So it does appear that there is a clinical benefit. Something to note is that complications or side effects from shockwave are minimal to almost non-existent. Next slide. We also performed a phase two trial uh, at our institution uh, looking at two different treatment schemes. Patients received the same number of shocks. Uh, however, one group received five consecutive treatments uh, of 720 shocks, 
And the second group had six treatments of 600 shocks spread out over two weeks. Both groups, again, receiving the same number of shocks. And we looked at IIEF scores, erectile hardness, at one, three, and six months after treatment. Next slide. What our study showed that was regardless of how the shocks were delivered, both groups had similar results. Now, in our study, we did not have a placebo group, so we have to consider that there is a placebo effect in, in, involved. However, whether they received the shocks over five days or over two weeks, both groups had similar responses in IIEF scores out to six months. Similarly, when evaluating erectile hardness, both groups had similar results. Uh, in our study, we saw that erectile hardness uh, was similar between the two groups out to six months. So uh, what does the AUA, um, our governing body, say about shockwave therapy? Uh, at this time, they consider it to be investigational and that there's not enough evidence to state whether or not this is an effective therapy. Um, the panel felt that shockwave therapy should only be used in an investigational setting in the context of an IRB-approved clinical trial. So problems with F the FDA and what they need to review. Well, shockwave therapy, as discussed before, is very heterogen heterogeneous. Uh, the FDA has to consider shockwave ther what shockwave therapy devices are being used and in what patient population. They also need to evaluate how, how many sessions, how frequently, the number of shocks, and is there a standard protocol? Additionally, they need to, to determine what are the risks to patients and what, uh, what are the potential benefits. So for the FDA, the issue with approving shockwave therapy is the amount of heterogeneity involved. So similarly, piggybacking off of what uh, Trinity had stated, the SMSNA also released their, released their position statement on restorative therapies. And they similarly state that with shockwave, uh, it should be considered experimental and under research protocols. And that also patients on these protocols should not incur any significant research costs that are out of pocket. So in conclusion, current therapies for erectile dysfunction do not provide a cure. The mechanisms for how shockwave improve erectile dysfunction appear to be promising, and initial clinical studies do demonstrate benefit. Despite the fact that there is a, a surprising lack of mechanistic data in humans. At this time, the use of shockwave should be considered experimental until more randomized trials with proven efficacy and protocols exist. So thank you very much again to the ISSM for inviting me uh, to speak about Shockwave today. And for those of you going to the SMSNA, I look forward to seeing you at our hometown here in Miami. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. It was a wonderful presentation as well. Really interesting. It was very, very good to uh, hear your personal, your personal experience because it had a, a, a a very interesting uh, um, head on to this conversation we can uh, discuss with you because we have the experience and I think uh, uh, all of us here from all around the world will benefit from this exchange of experience. I've been receiving some questions from uh, a lot of people but uh, please send your questions. Uh, we'll start uh, uh, with Trinity because we already have some questions about Botox, so it's a very um, uh, sought uh, theme, and uh, maybe you can start with it if it's okay with you, Trinity. So sure, of course. Do you want me to? Do you want to ask me the questions from the chat? Uh, yes, of, uh, you can see it also, right? I can. Yes, I, I'm happy to answer them if you would like. Oh, okay, no problem. If you think it's Anna Maria, I think it's it, um, for the audience. Maybe it's better if you read the the question on you because then everybody yes. know what question question it is. Yes, of course, and maybe you can just join the three questions about Botox 
and so uh, Trinity can uh, 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 answer all of them at the same sure. time. Okay. Yeah. So we'll start uh, with the first one. So uh, with the anonymous attendee. Uh, Botox. So, co can you salvage IC uh, patients who are responding poorly to maximum concentrations of trimix? Uh, if yes, what you do? What do you decrease the trimix dose? Okay, maybe it, it sounds like uh, if it if you should decrease the dose after the Botox injection. Yeah, I think I think the, the the various trials that were conducted, once again, the, the two that that we have uh, published, there's a number of case series that have have shown some efficacy with intracavernosal injection of Botox. The two concentrations that have, have been looked at was 50 and 100 international units. Um, the, the two RCTs show that, you know, the first RCT showed that 100 had more efficacy. So therefore, they used 100 in the second trial. Um, I think one of the author's conclusions and what I've heard from, from other uh, investigators and, and clinicians that are using it is, is that their thought is that patients with severe ED, they could actually improve their erectile function enough to where they would either be more responsive, for example, to trimix or hopefully to PD-5 inhibitors. Um, if you were to have a patient that you injected Botox in um, and, and you, prior to, uh, obviously, if they didn't have spontaneous erections sufficient for intercourse or for sexual relations, then I would absolutely decrease the dose of trimix just, just to be before giving it, because then you obviously worry about priapism. So um, once again, this is just clinical principle, you know, not necessarily uh, any evidence to support this. So uh, I, think, I think we still have a lot to learn from Botox. So we have another question in that uh, um, following. Is that uh, is it capable of inducing priapism? Yeah, so it's interesting you asked uh, this person asked that question because I don't know if people realize it, but it's actually Tom Liu has actually used it to to treat priapism. <laughs> okay. okay, thinking that thinking that it would actually um, uh, inhibit neuronal you know signaling and, and whatnot. Uh, so in the two, once again, I'm, I'm just going to speak about sort of the, the R2 RCTs because I, I, I think it's always important that we talk about sort of the best level of evidence. Um, uh, you know, in those trials, there was no signs of priapism. And once again, talking with, with uh, my colleagues uh, that, that, have, that have tried this to use it, they've reported no um, risk of uh, priapism. But you're also using this in patients that are, you know, essentially have severe ED. So um, I, I don't, I, I can tell you, theoretically, they, they, they could have uh, the mechanism of improving blood flow, decreasing vas penile vascular resistance, increasing neuronal function. Um, in theory, you could have uh, priapism, but that's the case for PD-5 inhibitors as well, right? Um, but exactly. we don't see. Uh, I think you already answered about the dose safety. So we are still trying to find uh, the right dose. Uh, but concerning safety, I think uh, we are still uh, giving the first steps, right? Yeah, I think I think what what would be nice to see. I, I so I you know once again when we look at these trials, you know you have to always critically evaluate it. You know you don't want to look at just the conclusions, right? You want to look at the critical evaluation. And, and we all know that like, if you have a patient with an IIEF score or, you know, of eight and you improve them to 12 or at best 14, they still have moderate to severe ED. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to, for me to say that that patient is benefiting from Botox. What we might be able to say this is that they, they're benefiting potentially as, as an adjuvant treatment, and you now need to combine it with some other, you know, treatment, i.e. intracavernosal injections, PD-5 inhibitors. But once again, that has not been studied. Um, we're all aware of trials that have looked at PD-5 inhibitor non-responders and looking at shock waves, looking at other treatments. Um, so I think that that's probably the trial that needs to be done. Yeah, but so sorry, safety, I think we all agree. It's, yeah. uh, it's, it's a yeah. safe uh, uh, drug. It and uh, uh, we have been using for many, many years in other organs, even in our speciality, uh, without uh, any kind of uh, relevant side effects. So I think it's a, a very safety, uh, safety yeah. drug. 
There, there was also a question, you know, just sorry, just to interrupt, but it, you know, there was a question about how you know systemic spillover. Yes, it, it was. I, I was. Think, it's the same. Uh, yeah, yeah. I so, think. I think one thing that that we all do when we're doing intracavernosal injection of things like stromal vascular fraction, um, you know, any stem cells, whatnot, we'll place a tourniquet around the base of the penis for injection. You know, so I think that that's our way of preventing systemic spillover. Yeah, and Figal is also asking, how is it injected? Yeah, uh, once, once again, the trial, they injected two milliliters, two cc's um, into the into the penis intracarbonosally. Okay, so I think uh, we can just uh, uh, go to Thomas as well. So Thomas, we have a lot of questions also for you. Uh, we just have uh, um, a statement from Miller that uh, is saying that here in Europe, we already have some devices approved for erectile dysfunction treatment. So uh, yes. it, it's an advantage for us. Bad luck for you. It is, it is. And I'm looking up to see if the ED1000 is uh, listed with the FDA. At least with Metaspec, it's still, it's still listed as approved for plantar fasciitis and heel spurs. Yeah. Um, even the device that we used during our trial, the, uh, the Mornova through Direx, uh, you know, it's approved, I believe, uh, there are some countries like uh, in Europe that it's approved in for treatment of erectile dysfunction, but here their device, the Runova, um, is still not approved for erectile dysfunction. Yeah. So we have another question from Paul Fedrov. He's asking if it's really necessary to perform the penile ultrasound uh, prior to the, the shockwave therapy. Yeah. And what I, factors can improve the outcome? Sorry. Yeah, sorry about that. So we were doing, we did do penile ultrasound beforehand because we were trying to, as part of our trial, doing Dopplers before and after, trying to see differences in blood flow. Um, whether it's necessary before shockwave, I don't think it's necessary. Uh, what factors improve outcomes? It's a great question. I don't think we have great answers. Uh, but, you know, again, heterogeneity in patient populations, you know, we've been primarily looking at mild to moderate erectile dysfunction. Um, you know, we have not looked specifically in patients, say, with, you know, who have uh, ED related to diabetes. We have not looked in the post-prostatectomy population either. Um, so I think more, more data is required to answer that fully. Okay, uh, uh, we are keeping with you. So another interesting question, because uh, people think about the uh, uh, atherosclerotic plagues. I don't think necessarily in the cavernous artery, but it's, a, it's another question from Omer. Uh, does uh, shockwave therapy can break the, the atherosclerotic plates? Yeah, another great question. It's not something that we've looked at. You know, we've thought, definitely thought about it within the context of how shockwaves are used to break apart kidney stones. Uh, but in, in reality, you know, on our ultrasounds, our pre-imaging, pre we're not really seeing atherosclerotic sclerotic plaques within the penile vessels itself. So we don't really have before and after. Yeah. It's, uh, it will be interesting to see it in the future, but all of us that are performing the, this penile ultrasound, uh, it's very difficult to see a uh, thoracic plaque. Sometimes you just see a, a small increase in the, in the small in, the intima thickness and nothing more. So it's very difficult to even to, have, uh, to evaluate the outcome after shockwave therapy. So we yeah, have sure. um, another question, a very interesting question, but more practical also for you, Thomas. What is the penetration depth of shock waves? And sh how should we hold the probe? And should we press the penis or just touch the skin? So it's really practical issues. Sure. Um, so we know that the depth of penetration of shock waves, even from the uh, kidney stone data, can go 10, 10 to 12 uh, uh, centimeters. But uh, because we're spreading this over a larger area, um, I, I believe the depth of the penetration is going to be completely through the penis. Um, and since we're not focusing on a single point, uh, things that do block the propagation, you know, we, when we do our trials like Silit, we will put a, a plexiglass panel over the uh, shockwave so that they are, are not able to propagate. And we do put like ultrasound jelly on the penis again to have good contact. Um, as far as, you know, with the probes, the probes are very different. I mean, you can see the one that we used uh, has the two linear probes. There are also round probes. In some studies, they're putting the, the shocks to the perineum. Some are going directly to the penis, to the corpora cavernosa. Um, so, you know, what is the best way to go about it? 
it's going to depend on the probe that you're using. Um, but you know, we typically put a sort of like a rubber band to hold the penis flat against it so that it has good con uh, good connectivity or good conductivity of the sound waves through the penis. So it's going to vary with the probes that you have. Okay, so uh, we are back to Trinity. It's getting bored. So we have uh, um, a very interesting uh, question that uh, we all ask ourselves. Uh, it's from Muammer Kendirsi. It's about the commercial side of PRP in our clinical practice. Uh, seems to be faster than the preclinical pre and clinical evidence. So comments. Yeah, Miramar Kendrzy, my previous uh, lab mate uh, in New Orleans. Ah, so uh, I, I thought yeah. the name was familiar. Yeah, yeah. Nice to, nice to see your name and, and get your question. Thanks, Kendrzy. Um, look, I, I mean, it's as, as you saw from the slide, you know, I called it the ugly side of restorative therapy. And Unfortunately, you know, the people, at least in the United States, I do not want to speak for other countries, but I can say in the United States, people are offering um, platelet-rich plasma intracarbonosal injections um, for a significant amount of money and are claiming that, uh, that you're going to have a larger penis, your phallus will grow, um, you'll have more hardness, and, and then they also make claims that you will have more desire and arousal. Um, and, and, and the people that are doing it, it's amazing. Uh, the, the majority of people that are doing this um, are actually not urologists. They are dermatologists, plastic surgeons, you know, these sort of, they have these pop-up clinics that do it. The other thing that, that happens is, is that they, we're not even sure if they're actually injecting platelet-rich plasma because as, as I've pointed out, I know it went fast in the slide, but you have to centrifuge the, um, the venous um, blood and you have to take out the correct fraction. And in theory, you have to activate it. Um, and that's done um, with different agents to release the, the cytokine. So we actually don't know what people are getting, uh, but they're getting charged a significant amount of money. And I think the reason why it's taken off so much is just simply because it's a moneymaker. Um, but that's why I think organizations like the ISSM uh, it's important that we we deliver this message to patients um, and deliver this message to the community, so the patients aren't abused. Um, I would love to I would love to see a properly done trial that that is global, looking at this with rigorous endpoints and, and an appropriate patient population, um, and then and then maybe we could um, come to a conclusion as this is if this is truly effective or not. Yeah. Uh... I was uh, preparing a question for you, but uh, uh, Vangelos Pulius just uh, put uh, the, the right question. Is completely uh, in, this, in this field, so he knows what he's talking about. Uh, he's asking about your opinion about uh, the PRP machines. And I know because I, I also work with different machines and uh, they have the special, special different uh, abilities to, to have the platelet uh, concentration. And uh, even then, it's uh, very difficult to uh, have the right uh, count of the platelets. And so it's a lot of factors that we cannot control. So what do you right. think about that? Yeah, I mean, it, it's really, it's dependent on, on the, um, so you, the centrifuge uh, machine has to have the ability to to um, essentially just be fast enough, right? To, to be able to separate out, separate out the, um, the different uh, 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 components of the uh, peripheral blood. Um, and, you know, as I said earlier, it is possible that people are using like centrifuge machines that, that are not capable of doing that. And they're essentially just injecting back into the patient their own blood, you know? Um, so, it, and, and because this is exempt, as you heard from Tom and you heard from myself, you know, in the United States, the FDA exempts, for example, for biologics, exempts autologous, these autologous use. So we have no way to regulate it. We have no way to know if, if what, what's happening out there in the community. So um, th there are a number of trials, in, you know, that are being done globally to look at this. And, and there is a lot more rigor as it relates to how proving that you're using platelet-rich plasma, proving that you're truly activating it pharmacologically to release growth factors, you know, that, that's what has to be done. If I may piggyback, so we are, we are one of the centers doing a, a randomized blinded placebo-controlled trial with PRP, and we're using specifically a 
a centrifuge that has an optical sensor to try and act, you know, have a consistent product. Um, and so we, we submitted this for publication, but we're actually even showing that even with this device, you have a high variability with growth factors. So even if your platelet concentrations happen to be similar, uh, what's actually contained within those platelets can vary substantially. Yeah. So I anticipate having some of the same issues with shockwave is with PRP. There's going to be heterogeneity in patient population, the product that's actually being delivered, what's inside the platelet product, uh, how that's being held in the penis. Um, so there's, there's a lot to consider with PRP. And, and, and just to add on to what Tom's saying is, is that, you know, what, what should happen is, is that you should actually prove that you are, you're actually, what are the growth factors that are present in the PRP prior to injection and correlate that to response. Additionally, when we perform stem cell trials or stromal vascular fraction, you prove, you know, ex vivo, what is present there prior to injecting. And if you look at the trials that are done, for example, the, the trials that are done in other fields that are published in, in you know, I would say reparable journals where, where they're looking at this type of rigor, that's required, you know? So you, we, we need to be able to do that um, and, and request and require our, our, the investigators to, to perform those types of studies prior to publication. In my personal view is that uh, it will be very difficult to do a multi international uh, uh, without funding and uh, yeah, PRP, absolutely. we have no funding. No. So uh, I think uh, we'll not see that in the next future for sure. Um, yeah. We have uh, another... <laughs> so I was going to yeah. say with the funding, so yeah. you know, we got our started because we, we were lucky in that we got a donation to start our trial. You know, when we approach the companies that create the centrifuges, they have really no interest in the, in the ED space because much like the shockwave machines that are approved on this 510K process, the centrifuges that create the PRP, they are what are regulated. And they are, they are uh, approved uh, with, with the labeling that the PRP is intended to be used in orthopedics. So for them, there's not a real interest in the ED space because if they want to do that, they would have to go through rigorous FDA, uh, FDA regulation trials mm -hmm. and proof that it will work. Yeah, you're okay. So you're right, funding, funding is hard. It's difficult yeah, to get these started. It's very difficult. We have another question for my friend, uh, Luis Octavio Torres, my friend, how are you? Uh, he uh, has a very interesting question also uh, concerning uh, the same aspect that we have been talking about. It's about, uh, uh, shockwave therapy because it's not approved by the regulatory agencies and but people uh, uh, keep uh, doing shockwave in Brazil so and charging a lot from it for it so he's asking what the situation in the United States so it's up to you two guys what's your situation in the United States El so Presidente El Presidente <laughs> ex, ex El Presidente of the ISSM um, Tom, do you want to take it? I, I'm in, yeah, I, can, I mean, um, I would say, you know, South, South Florida is a lot like Brazil, it sounds like. Uh, so there, there's, uh, there's probably a shockwave uh, machine being offered on every corner. Um, not shockwave, but sounds like shockwave, you know, this gains wave device is truly, truly everywhere. You know, you can Google any men's health clinic down here, and they will all offer gains wave as this revolutionary device that's going to cure your erections. And they'll have the pictures of the guy with the gains wave machine and two much younger women under each arm. Uh, yeah, it's, it's everywhere. Uh, patients, patients are getting charged for it. Yeah. And that's what we're competing with. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah. like, a, like a robotic in the cancer. Yeah. Everybody has to have one. Yeah, um, I mean, so so uh, I, if I can make one comment, you know, of course. I, think it, I think it's relevant. Um, in Philadelphia, which is in the Northeast uh, United States, you know, right out, right near New York, and 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 I, I about a, three months ago, I got a phone call from the uh, their main like newspaper, and they actually did a piece on this, and and they they have there are physicians, they're not urologists by the way, they're physicians that are offering gains wave radio waves and are literally claiming that it will cure ed and they are and the, and it's this is in out there online as well as in newspapers and and 
people, unfortunately, men are having to pay for this out of pocket. And, and it's very unfortunate because as you heard from time, biologically gains wave or radio waves, it cannot induce any biological effects. It's, we might as well yell at the penis as, as, as high as you know, with our, you know, with our voice. It's the same, it's the same effect, you know, it's just, it's really unfortunate what's happening. Yeah. Again, for uh, Thomas, um, I think it's a, a very interesting question from Ida Putra. And which ED patients would benefit from shockwave therapy? Because uh, she is uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. In, calling in attention view, for using the combined with the PDE5 inhibitors. Yeah, in, in my view, shockwave therapy is, is what it's going to do is it's either going to take somebody who maybe needs PDE5s once in a while off of it or reduce the amount of PDE5 that they're going to, that they require. Say it takes somebody from Viagra 100 down to 50. Uh, but I still do not believe that this is going to be a cure-all where men after treatment are going to be completely off PDE5s, where they're going to go from needing injection therapy to back to normal erection. Um, I, that's just not the level of response that we've been seeing. Yeah. Yes. No, no. Can I, can I make a comment, please? Of course. Um, I, I've sort of been in this field since the 90s where we were doing gene therapy and now we're, you know, doing, you know, I, you know, shockwave, whatnot. The, the reality is, is the following. No single agent, i.e. no low intensity shock wave, no stromal vascular fraction, no biologic is going to quote unquote cure ED. What, what we need to do as a field, and, and I, I'm Tom and Renji and, and others are doing this, is where you start to look at combination therapy with long-term maintenance of a biologic low intensity shock wave. So you have combination of drugs or biologics or technology um, that is going to um, induce long-term changes and, and essentially changes in the end organ or phenotype. And the best way to think about it is, is that patients that are hypertensive, do we just like treat them with one antihypertensive? No. If, they, if they're unresponsive, we combine it, we change. We, we, we look at a diabetic or a chronic kidney disease is gonna have a different agent than that of, a, of someone who has, you know, a secondary to, for example, you know, uh, uh, aging. So we as a field have to sort of evolve. And that's where we are, we're at that inflection. And, and I think that's where we, where we need to move things to. Yeah, I agree with you and some of, uh, of comments in the, I didn't chat or in the key and I, they are uh, also emphasizing that aspect that we should do uh, multi-modality uh, treatments. And I think the way uh, maybe it's like that. But uh, I have a question also for you, Trinity, because uh, we know that uh, erectile dysfunction is not uh, a penile disease per se. And uh, if you are trying to do um, a therapy in a confined space, uh, such as the corpus cavernosum, you know that uh, will not uh, stay the, the, the molecular uh, uh, agent that they are putting there. Um, so the question is, uh, uh, why should it work uh, at first place? And it, that question comes uh, with um, the, the question that uh, Natalie uh, just uh, uh, not that least, from Rustamov that uh, was asking how long should we, uh, the rubber be placed uh, around the base of the penis to all the drug inside? Yeah, so are, are you, I just want to make sure I, I understand the question. Are you specifically talking about Botox right now? Botox. Got it. Okay. Yeah, so I think um, I'll answer the question from, um, uh, from our, our participant. Uh, you know, how long do we keep the, the rubber band at the base? I, I mean, I there is no exact amount. I mean, yeah. you know, you know, I, I would, I typically, when I've done these types of things, you know, at some point the patient is just uncomfortable, you know, and I mean, and I, and I actually do do a tourniquet, you know, I think Tom was talking about a little rubber band that he placed around for the shock waves. I mean, I place a tourniquet because I want it to sit there. Uh, so I'd say two minutes, right? So two minutes is kind of my time. I've heard of people doing it longer, like, you know, you know, upwards of five minutes. I, I don't know what the answer is, but, but what I will tell you is, is that the penis anatomically, and this is work that was done literally in the seventies, you know, and, and eighties where 
the two corporate cavernosa they they come they, they communicate and we've got a sinusoid so if you inject botox in the base or in the tip it's going to be able to get through the sinusoids through the gap junctions and the smooth muscle and endothelium and communicate throughout the penis okay so what you're going to see at a molecular level, a cellular level is you should see changes that occur throughout. Okay. So what will happen with Botox? In theory, you're inhibiting sympathetic stimulation and potentially promoting non-adrenergic, non-cholinergic neural transmission, right? So nitrinergic, right? Uh, uh, re release. But we don't know that. There's no proof. Exactly. I mean, we, we got a couple of animal studies that, that are hinting towards it. Why did Jeff Campbell, you know, see a change in alpha smooth muscle actin content? I have no clue. But I suspect if the, the thought is, is that if there's more blood flow, there's more blood flow, you're able to provide um, uh, nutrients that preserve and prevent atrophy after nerve injury. But does that happen in the diabetic patient or in the vascular path? We don't know. So I think for Botox, I, I think it's it's new, it, it's exciting, and we'll go to the title. Is it the 2022 snake oil? I don't know, but but I think it warrants uh, a further investigation, both preclinically as well as in appropriately performed clinical study. Yeah. Thomas, any uh, comment on that? I think it's a very interesting... Yeah. Uh... Yeah, so for, we should for, state. yeah, for our, for our PRP, uh, what we've been doing is we do a kind of like a loose tourniquet, uh, but actually for more like 20 minutes, uh, and have the patient grip the penis to try and hold the PRP in the penis for some duration of time. Our concern being that if you inject it into a highly vascular organ, it's just going to go right exactly. on and out. Yeah. That's the question because it will fade away before it even then the, uh, the the clinical effects that we want, especially with concerning the platelets, uh, yeah, it, it will be impossible because it becomes immediately diluted uh, within the penis in the corpus cavernosum. So uh, I think it's a very attractive uh, therapy. We all want a new therapy in this field we are all eager for it but unfortunately we are not receiving uh, too much evidence that we can use it in our daily practice at least safe with safety yeah. um uh, another question bo uh, both of you can uh, answer please but we can uh, uh, start with trinity because it's for him it's about the use either of botox or prp for erect uh, for premature ejaculation, sorry. Yeah, I saw those questions. I knew you were gonna ask. Yeah. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I just joined the questions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, listen, I, I as it relates to PRP, I mean, come on, like, what are we doing? You know, I, I, I really think that that's, I think it's rubbish, frankly. Um, uh, as it relates to premature ejaculation, I think because that. The, uh, let's, uh, I'll say it this way, because we know that um, there is effects of, um, for example, serotonin reuptake inhibitors that are affecting neuronal uh, release and, and affecting potentially neuroplasticity. Um, in theory, I guess Botox could, you know, modulate you know, uh, adrenergic, cholinergic transmission and, and have that effect. But it's if that effect is going to be in the end organ, not at the spinal level, not at the central level, right? So I, I just don't know how that's going to improve, um, you know, uh, latency in patients with premature ejaculation. But I know people have done it. And I, I, I think there's actually some, I think there's actually, you know, some case reports that it works. But I think I think that really warrants some additional investigation. Thomas, yeah. to have? we haven't done anything with it. Haven't actually even thought about it until it was just just uh, just asked. But uh, I'll, I'll quote the great like Peter Schlegel from the infertility world. He's like, you know, you can swing a dead cat over your hat or over your head, and something might happen, but it's probably placebo effect. So you know, if you inject anything into the penis with premature ejaculation, where there can be many factors that are not just end organ, but they're you know super tentorial things, things that are happening you know at a more uh, more psycho psychologic level, 
Um, I, I have no idea. We've but uh, may, uh, we have here a comment from Kobe uh, that uh, is saying that there are going ongoing trials with Botox for premature ejaculation, and uh, is right. So uh, we should keep trying to find something right. uh, to cure premature ejaculation. But I think uh, they are doing the injection uh, uh, directly yeah. in the bulbous cavernosum or bulbous spongiosum not directly uh, into corpus cavernosum yeah. for premature ejaculation. I'm not sure because I'm not, I'm not yeah, going to comment so, on that, but uh, I thought you know, there's was something like that. There's a trial, Francesco, um, uh, not, um, Francois, excuse me, Francois, is, okay. uh, Giuliano is doing a trial right now because he okay. showed early on, you know, but I, I, I think he's, I think that trial is ongoing, but I, I don't know the, the results. Yeah, um, me neither. You know, and, it, and it would, and it is injected, you know, in the muscle. So you okay. should, uptake you know but at, at potentially a spinal level as was locally but i just it i think i think it just needs clinical evidence you know really high level of evidence to show that but um i think i think you know folks that are like francois and and and, and others are the people that sh that are going to be the best to answer that question yeah but uh, uh kobe is also uh, yep and kobe uh, absolutely and he has he's stuff. saying but he's uh, confirming what I, I was saying it was for ed in the corpus cavernosum and for in the muscles for premature ejaculation okay yeah in that case it makes sense it looks um, like our president has a question she's raising her hand uh maybe she's want to shut up uh, shut up shut oh, us I, up. I, 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 I don't want to shut you up <laughs> So I, I just wanted to confirm that that the ESSM uh, Francois group had quite a lot of presentations on on what they they having of trials. No, I was actually going to ask a question because I cannot write the questions because you know you is very involved in the ESSM and uh, Tom and Trinity in the SNSNA. Do you think that we as societies should be more upfront in the public with the lack of evidence because you, you describe very well that people offer all these um, treatments and and we don't have a lot of evidence. Should we be more aggressive in, in you know, addressing this? What do you think as societies? I'll let Tom respond and then I'll be happy to answer. <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. I think the societies are already pretty upfront about what our position is. The AUA, at least in the US, we have the AUA, the SMS have put out pretty clear guideline that says that these are experimental these are not FDA approved, uh, and that patients really should not be incurring costs. The problem is, you know, you can put those statements out there, but if your family medicine practitioner, orthopod, gynecologist wants to open up a clinic and start doing these types of therapies, because the regulation of the devices is minimal, there's really nothing stopping them from do it, doing it, and there's nothing stopping patients from paying. So it becomes tricky where you have some unproven therapy and because it's not regulated, they can almost make whatever claims they want. Uh, and then meanwhile, you have the academic center across the street trying to tell the patient it's probably not going to work. Here are the other therapies. And you're talking pills, injections, prosthetics. You know, the, the shockwave therapy, the PRP, it sounds really good and it's an easy sell. And Anna Marie, I think, I think you as and you and, and the entire ISSM, um, you know, uh, EC executive committee and, and all of the committees. I think by putting together things like these webinars where people are able to sort of listen uh, to sort of the thought of, of, of people like Tom and myself, I think is the first step. Um, I do think that the ISSM should, should be very vocal about, about what the evidence shows for this and come up with a, a um, you know, position statement, you know, or at least a, a white paper on it. Um, I think that's what you're doing anyway right now. Um, so. I do think that we should, as a society, be more vocal. Um, and as you heard from Tom, the SMSNA now, we, we put out our position statement in 2019 and then revised it last year because it, we're just seeing some really alarming things happening in North, North America. Yeah, and concerning ESSM, it's exactly the same. I think it's really important. I was really excited about uh, your invitation to be here, also to to give uh, uh, my view and the uh, European view. I think it's uh, uh, interesting to s set the, the, the boundaries for the, the right uh, clinical practice. And we as society, we have that uh, moral duty for sure. Um, 
Uh, and and I have... think maybe we need to go out more in the public because, as you say, we, exactly. we have quite we have position statements, we have white papers, we have yeah. guidelines, but you know, no, as you say, Tom, no one reads them, and um, so that's yes. And in, in that way, I really think uh, our social media has a huge uh, mm. uh, role in that part because people uh, maybe not reading our position statement, maybe it's not going to our congress, but for sure they are uh, reading and interacting with our social media. And uh, I think we sh uh, will should keep uh, doing uh, uh, that thing that uh, keeping not uh, uh, wasting money because not real. But we should put money in that field because people are very uh, attentive to our um, to our policies, to our indications, to our guidelines. They sh just have to have access. I'm so sorry, but I think we have to finish this webinar because we are yeah. out of time. So I just, on behalf of the society and myself, really, really would like to thank you all for an excellent webinar. I think that it shows us how our field is, but I think that the energy, I was thinking of your curves, Thomas, with, with the high peak and the long lasting, we have had a very high and long lasting energy in this webinar. Uh, thank you for all the questions, the excellent presentations and uh, the moderation. So. I really, really want to thank, thank you. you. And um, it was an excellent webinar. So to everyone, take care and stay safe. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank and you, everybody. I See you wanna, soon. I just want to, I forgot that, but I just want to advertise our next webinar, which will be in March 31. And uh, that will be on diabetes and sexuality. And I hope to see you all there. So thank you. Take care, all of you.